Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Welcome to a new video. I'm joined here, subhanallah, with Abu Yazid. And Abu Yazid, um, some of you may not know, is a revert to Islam. He was a host on ABN's Jesus or Muhammad. He was a co-host of David Wood. He was heavily involved in apologetics. He was involved in ministry. He gave sermons. And now, subhanallah, he is back as a Muslim. And what's really interesting, uh, Abu Yazid, is uh, this just hit me when I was speaking to you last time. Uh, the thought that we could have been, like in, in an alternative timeline, we could have been like the fiercest of enemies at each other's throats, producing videos against each other. But subhanAllah, we're here together. And please take us through your journey. But before any of that, uh, please give us a timeline of, of your journey. Okay. You were, you, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I have a, a internet tag that I've been using since, you know, the early, early 2000s, which is uh, Seeker 248. Um, and it basically sums up, you know, my journey and my attitude for this, you know, these, these years now, seeking, just seeking the truth. I was raised in a, um, a Christian home, a Christian background. Um, I'm African American. My family came from the Deep South. Uh, they were very involved. They were founding members of a particular denomination called the um, Baptist Missionary um, okay. Denomination, and they started churches after World War. I mean, not World War One, but um, the Civil War, and they became free. They the first thing they did was establish a community, and the first thing they established in their community was a church. So spirituality, religion was extremely important in my household. But the particular uh, creed of that, of that religion that I was brought up in, I did question it. If I'm to believe these things and there seems to be contradictions between these various doctrines, especially when it comes to the very nature of God, especially when it comes to the nature of God, there's internal, seemingly internal contradictions they have to be reconciled. And so far in my life where I've, I've come to this point in my life where I've come to understand these internal contradictions cannot be reconciled. You either go, are going to have to believe in the Trinity and the deity of Christ, uh, the deity of the spirit by faith, quote unquote, meaning you don't understand, don't understand the Trinity, you don't understand the doctrine how it actually works and you don't understand how these contradictions could be reconciled with each other and you just believe it anyway, or you right. have to reject it. I chose right. to reject it. So right. I studied every, every religion, every um, particular faith that I could uh, look in it, go to a library and look, find a book about or go online and look or buy something at the bookstore from Taoism to Buddhism, to African indigenous religions, to uh, Kemetics, to, Whatever you can basically think of and name, every every facet, denomination, and sect of Christianity, and it finally boiled down to Islam. And it so happened that I was involved in a church, um, and one of the members of the church was another young man like myself who wasn't, we were about the same age, and it was announced that he was leaving the church because he converted to Islam. And that really sparked my interest at that point where I was at the point. I have to find out what this Islam is about. So um, I, at the time, I was, this is like the early, early 2000s, and I was working in downtown Detroit. And I was on my lunch break or after work, I would go to various bookstores seeing if I could find a Quran. And I, I, I was find, it was a hard time finding a Quran at this time. Now it's a little bit easier nowadays to find a Quran. Um, besides going on online, <laughs> you can get the Quran. Oh, but any bookstore, gets, you can get a Quran. But this was early 2000s, a little bit different. And finally, I, I found a paperback uh, translation of the Quran published by Penguin. And I bought it. And I, I remember the, the lady behind the counter, she had to be a Christian because she, she didn't want to sell it to me. She was like, uh, she looked at me, she's like, you sure you want to buy this? I'm like, I'm positive, I want to buy this. And she sold it and I got it. 
and I, I started and I and I began reading and I re, I can still to this day remember you know reading in English you know this is this is a book that explains things clearly for sure you know it, it, it explains the truth okay that's what I'm looking for I'm looking for something that explains the truth and this is what the Quran is claiming so let's keep reading and within a, a month or so I read the whole entire translation of the meaning of the Quran and I was Again, uh, working downtown Detroit, I had found an Islamic bookstore um, around the corner from where I worked. And uh, Brother Hamid, if anybody from Detroit knows that you know that bookstore, you know Brother Hamid. Uh, I would go down there during my, my lunch breaks and I would look at, check out books, buy books, things like just hang out for a little while. And after doing this for maybe three or four months, the brother was speaking to an African -Amer American brother and they were pointing at me look, and looking at me. And the brother was like, you know, how long have you been Muslim? And I was like, well, I'm not Muslim. You know, why are you here every day? Because, you know, I, I, I like Islam, but I'm not Muslim. So the African-American brother took me to the side. He explained the five pillars of Islam, asked me if I wanted to take the Shahada. I said, yes, take the Shahada. That began my journey in Islam. That began my journey in Islam. How old and were you at the time? Uh, this is like, again, this is the late 90s, early 2000s. I had to be around like maybe 21, 22, something like that. Early 20s, early 20s. And, you know, most of my friends at the time in the, the neighborhood I grew up in, we all went to Detroit public schools, which are, which are known to be a little rough around the edges um, in the inner city, basically. Uh, people were people were into either hanging out, chasing girls, or in a illegal lifestyle, selling drugs. And I have to admit, to be honest, before Islam, I was into those same things. I was about you know smoking weed and blunts and drinking forties and chasing girls. And I even had my own uh, pharmaceutical business, <laughs> but. When Islam came and when Allah stirred up in my heart that desire to seek the truth, seek knowledge, um, and, I, and I found Islam, it took a while, but finally I let that go and embraced Islam fully. One of the things that actually pushed me to really get serious about the deen is my cousin committed suicide. And it was very tragic. He hung himself. And I remember seeing him in the casket and we were the same age we grew up. We played together and seeing him. I was like, you know, one day this is going to be me. It could be tomorrow. It could be 10 years from now. It could be 50 years from now, but it's going to be me. I need to make a decision and get serious about this. So I began getting real serious about the Dean. Um, my favorite thing was being in the, for me, everybody has something that they love about Islam. Some people love reciting the Quran. Some people love reading Hadith. Um, some people love, you know, making Salat. I love being in the Masjid because the Masjid was such a peaceful place for me. Even when nobody else was at the Masjid, I would just stay in the Masjid and just read the Quran and do things like this. And it really helped me. It helped me to help me in my spirituality. It helped me in my maturity, transitioning from a, a young man into a grown man. It did a lot for me. You know, I, I say, even when I was Christian, even when I returned to Christianity, I still had to admit that Islam saved me. Is Islam saved me from uh, a fate and a lifestyle that many other young men fell into in the area that I lived in. And I'm not the only person who has that story. You know, a lot of people have that story. Um, so Islam did a, a whole lot for me. And I was I'm internally grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the name and to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, so moving on from that. So, so, so just, I, want, I want to focus on this one thing. So, so you're saying that um, accepting Islam, accepting the spiritual aspect of Islam um, made you made you a better person without a doubt, even though 
um, at the, b- before that, you were you were a Christian that didn't really follow it much, right? I was a Christian by culture. I, I lived, okay. I okay. lived in the United States, and eighty five percent of people in the United States are Christian, so I was Christian. Right. So you're saying that there's there, without a shadow of a doubt, being a, a spiritual conservative Muslim is better than being a cultural Christian that just goes with the flow, right? Oh, one hundred and ten percent. Right. I think that the a lot of I mean a lot of the the I get a lot of um, Christian visitors on my channel, and and they have this uh, twisted view that um, you know Satan created Islam, right? Yeah. So to them, to them, you're just saying that yeah, Islam took you away from um, that type of lifestyle. That that. It itself is is uh, Aki, I'm, I'm sure would, yeah Aki, uh, just for the sake of the, I want to be honest with you I was an alcoholic I was a, I was uh, addicted to marijuana I came from a family of alcoholics and drug addicts you know I had three different uncles who all overdosed on heroin oh, I'm sorry. three uncles who overdosed on heroin my father used crack cocaine during my teen years. So it basically nullified whatever guidance he would have gave me as a nice. teenager, teenager because he was so caught up in his drug addiction. Alhamdulillah, he, he is completely clean and he's Muslim now. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. I was the type of person who, right. even as a young man, a young t- a teenager, early 20s, I would wake up in the morning and smoke marijuana. I would go to the store and purchase liquor, drink it, go to work, wait till my wait till my lunch break, smoke more marijuana and drink more liquor, get off work, go immediately, get more marijuana and get more liquor, and uh, basically do that until I, f- I fell asleep at night. That was my lifestyle. That was the lifestyle of not everyone, but a lot of people. Where that I hung around and, and lived around, yeah, yeah, you know, it was all about pleasure. It was all about um, hedonism. In reality, my religion and the religion of a lot of people, even people who call themselves Christians, people who have been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, their real, true religion is hedonism. It's about having as much sex as possible having as much alcohol as possible, having um, as much marijuana, her- heroin, cocaine, crank as possible. Uh, Abu Yazid, I'd like to move on to something you mentioned previously. Um, uh, you, in passing, you said, uh, before I became a Christian. So you, you, so let's, let's take the audience through that. Um, so you were a Muslim for how long? I was a Muslim up into uh, 2011. Okay, so early 2000s until 2011, so around how long? A decade? Almost a decade. Almost okay, so you were a Muslim for a decade and then you became a Christian. That is correct. Please um, expand on that. Well, um, I think uh, people who leave the dean, everyone has their own story, but I think there's there's certain things that they all have in common for the most part, you know, for the most part. Um, one is uh, the shubuhat, the doubts that creep into the heart. So one begins to, there's some aspect of Islam that a person begins to doubt about, you know. Uh, for me, the doubt was uh, more concentrated on the issue of salvation because I began to really question about what's going to happen to me when I, uh, I leave this earth and I face the judgment. Am I going to heaven? I'm, I'm going to hell. And one of the, one of the, the chief doubts that um, Christian polemics use against Islam is, well, you guys don't have any guarantee of salvation. You know, you don't know what's going to happen. Okay, you're a great Muslim. You're a good person. Um, but... Uh, has Allah guaranteed that you're not going into the hellfire and going into uh, the into Jenna? So these are common occurrences, and they can cause doubt in the individual. 
they can kind of cause doubt in the individual, um, especially doubt gives way to doubt. So if there's there's a you know a small piece of doubt in the heart, I can feed that, and it can grow bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, so that's that's one aspect of what happened to me. Um, also, there's an issue that's common to all religions, to Islam, to Christianity. The, it, all the religions have to deal with um, is called theodicy or the problem of evil. Why does evil occur in the world? Why do uh, bad things happen in the world? If God is so good and he's so loving, he's so, he's so uh, merciful, why would evil things happen in the world? Why would evil things happen to you? Why do evil things happen to your loved ones, the people you love? So that's the, this, the, this issue of theodicy. Again, it's not just a Muslim problem. It's yeah. you know, every, every religion. How do you how do, how do that how does that like uh, shift you towards Christianity? Well, there were uh, in my personal life, I was going through uh, various fitting, uh, lots of fitting uh, internally and externally. Uh, I had issues with my health. Um, I had issues in inside my family with my loved ones, and the issues become it became very critical. In the midst of going through tests and trials and tribulations. It can become very overwhelming for a person. Um, so if you add certain religious doubts, and then you add uh, traumatic experiences and stress, it, it was almost like the shaitan was putting so much pressure on me that I felt like I had to get away. I just, I had to step away from this. And then I remember, I started remembering you know, that, you know, my family of origin is Christian. You know, the vast majority of my family is still Christian. I have some Muslim family members, but we're very few. The vast majority of us are still Christian. Um, so you have family members coming to you as a revert, telling you maybe you made a wrong decision. Maybe, uh, maybe bad things are happen happening to you because you left Jesus Christ, maybe that maybe that's the reason why that why this is happening to you. I got to you. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. During all this time, I felt like people had abandoned me. You know, people weren't being there for me. People weren't didn't care what 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 was happening in my life and what was what was going on in my life. Um, people cared more about. You know, are you showing up to the masjid to perform salah, which is extremely important? Yes, but nobody wanted to know, or know what's going on in your life. You know, what's what's happening with you? What's going on with you? Um, right. Even, you know, I feel like even when I I finally uh, expressed what was going on inside of me with the doubts, I felt rejected because instead of People coming with uh, good arguments to refute those doubts. People were like, well, I, "You know, something's wrong with you, Aki. Uh, you know, uh, you know, stop calling me. I don't want to hear about that." You know, oh, you know. I'm I'm sorry you had to go through that. Yeah, and that should never happen. If somebody yeah, comes and tells you, uh, we should be able to speak to each other if we are, if we're truly brothers and we're truly sisters, we should be able to express ourselves to each other. And find consolence and help within each other. So, if someone comes to you and says, "I'm having this, I'm having a doubt about something. I'm, I'm struggling with my dean right now." Uh, you don't, you don't, tell, you don't push the person away. You don't tell the person they're a fascist. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't you help them. You help them, and, and you, you, uh, if you, if you're not knowledgeable enough to help them, you find someone else, or you find the resources to be able to answer those doubts because the scholars have said that the cure for doubts is knowledge. You have to be able to express this, the knowledge to the person in order to cure their doubt. But you have to take an interest, in, you have to have humanity, you have to have an interest in other human beings and love other hu human beings to be able to do that. Okay. Um, what really interests me is uh, how you went from just being a, a conservative Christian to then being um, a host on ABN's Jesus or Muhammad. How did that happen? Well, I, I sent an email to um, ABN after I became Christian 
and uh, basically saying, I, what, I, you know, I, I've been watching uh, Jesus and Muhammad. Uh, I've been watching David Wood and Sam, Sam Shimon, and I wanted you guys to know that I've left Islam and I've become Christian. Somebody from the network passed it along to David Wood. David Wood jumped on that <laughs> immediately, and he invited me onto the show. And once he invited me onto the show, uh, I did it, and they were like, you want to stay for another show? You want to stay around? Sure, I'll stay around. And me staying around turned into me becoming regular on uh, Jesus Muhammad. Um, so how big of a, a deal was Jesus or Muhammad? You, you, you mentioned uh, some things over the phone. I don't know if you'd like to expand on that. How, how big of a success was it? I think uh, for all the things I just said, it was successful. It did what it was supposed to do. Um, it did that and more. So from a strictly uh, apologetics standpoint, it took something that was strictly um, academic to a certain level where you know the average person didn't, didn't the average person didn't know what Islam was and they didn't really care in America. Um, you know, Muhammad Ali was Muslim. That's what the average person in America knew. But after 9-11, there became a hunger for people wanting to know what Islam was about. How, how successful was it financially, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, it was, it was very successful financially. Um, ABN, Aramaic Broadcasting Network, they were like doing these Aramaic Christian shows. Where they, they were doing shows with people singing the little guitars, singing Aramaic Christian songs. And it was like a really niche kind of a broadcasting to certain people, you know, certain Christians in the Middle East. And that was about it. But when they started doing uh, Jesus and Muhammad, and they had another show about jihad, I can't remember the exact name of it, um, but it was about it was about jihad. When they started doing that, then they started getting viewership, they started getting more donations, and eventually that led up to making deals in the, the Christian broadcasting, Christian media world, where they were able to forge relationships with, you know, uh, companies like TCT, which uh, I believe is the Christian, uh, the Trinity um, channel, or the Trinity Broadcasting Network, or something like that. And they, I mean, they made deals for a lot of money. Let's just say that a lot of money was put on the table. That's when you, that's when you saw uh, the, 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 the commencement of the Trinity Channel. So it was, they had ABN, then they started the Trinity Channel. When they got into, uh, they started making deals with some of these Christian broadcasters, and they were given money to start this new network, which would be an all English network, making all. So that's when you started having all these apologists coming on. They started doing shows. They were doing marathons, uh, like ten different guests, uh, ten different people. You know, show live shows with three, four different people, and, and they're just, you know, talking about Islam, talking about. Uh, uh, Muslims talking about the issue of jihad um, shows like you just said ten reasons not to believe Muhammad so Allah will they sell them twenty reasons why this or that because that money started coming in and people there were people they were definitely getting uh, getting a check um, it wasn't like you know they they weren't priests and they weren't doing this for free you know so people have speakers fees um, people were parlaying being on ABN into starting their own 501c3 nonprofit corporation so they could sell books and sell merchandise and sell videotapes and CDs and things like this. Um, people were uh, setting up uh, debates across the nation and traveling from church to church. People, I mean, made a whole entire career of just going across the, na the nation, giving lectures about jihad, you know, to the point uh, certain individuals even got government contracts, you know, get money from the government to lecture, you know, the FBI about jihad um, and things like this. So, yeah, people parlay that into uh, a money making venture. I mean, most of these right. guys have no education whatsoever in, in anything related. Well, first of all, they have no education as far as anything related to Islam, you know, but even as far as uh, Christianity, most of these guys don't have any um you know degrees in religious studies or theology or, or anything like that um they're basically self-taught a lot of it is google taught 
to be honest. Mm. So, so what happened to you next? What ha like, what happened after that? I'm talking well, about the, the show. Yeah. Well, as early as maybe like 2013, I really began to slow down. You know, I really wasn't interested in doing public appearances or doing a lot of debating or things like that. So that's that. two years. That's two years after you, you, you left Islam, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So 2011, 2012, I was very active. 2013, I was really not that active at all. Um, so I, I was doing ABN. I was doing public appearances and debates. I had a, I had a blog and I had a YouTube channel. Um, I think in 2013, I didn't do any YouTube channels at all. I barely posted anything on my blog. I didn't do any, I did maybe a few lectures, but I didn't do any debates. And I maybe appeared on ABN a few times. So I had slowed down a bit time. Um, I felt at the time things were moving a little too fast on my part. Like I, I just, you know, like people were had expectations of me. You know, we want you to talk. We want you to speak. We want you to do this. We want you to do that. Come here. Talk about this. Show up here. Debate about this. Uh, we are uh, we going to put you out here. And like, ooh, it's moving a little too fast for me. Um, I didn't really have a, I didn't have the desire to be quote famous. You know, I didn't want to be a YouTube. I didn't. I didn't have the the desire to be a social media influencer. I, I didn't have the desire the desire to make money off of religion. Um, I, I had I had my own career. I had my own uh, education. I did I didn't need this. I didn't need to do this stuff for a living. I didn't have I didn't want a apologetics career, quote unquote. Um, so, but you were going to. I mean, that was offered to you. You were offered the opportunity uh, to be the face of the ex-Muslim community, if you call it that. Yeah. Yeah, um, I've said this in another interview. There, there's always every few, every year or two or, f or three, there's always some new ex-Muslim who is the hot new ex-Muslim. Right. And you know, I had the opportunity to be the hot new ex-Muslim. You know, and if I took that opportunity, yeah, I would have had notoriety. I would have had fame, and I would have made some money. Um, you, you would have been you would have been on like 30 of my thumbnails <laughs> <laughs> true, true true indeed so so what happened um you start to learn more about christianity if yeah. i recall correctly uh, please expand on that so i felt like you know if i'm going to be invited to speak at churches and uh, you know give a lecture here at this university and be on ab you know i need to uh one i need to join i need to become a member of a church uh, I need uh, what in the Christian world you would call covering uh, leadership from, from, from a pastor and from elders. Uh, I need to get grounded. I need to get educated, you know. So I, I enrolled in seminary. I, uh, I found a church that I, that I wanted to join. Um, I went to the, the, to the leaders of the church, told them what I was doing, who I was, that I used to be Muslim. Um, and really got, got that surrounding and try to get that grounding where I just wasn't just out here doing stuff on my own. Um, just, you know, and as I began to study in church and in seminary, going through these, uh, these, these doctrines that, uh, that, that hold up the Christianity in the church and beginning to really learn um, I feel like I was more able to speak about these things with some type of authority, with some type of grounding, you know. And as I was able to really look at these things, like I said, I was when I when I came into Christianity, uh, I the people I were around were uh, deeply Calvinistic, and I became deeply Calvinistic, and I began to question these that aspect. Because that has really has to deal with the issue of salvation. What is salvation? Um, how does one become saved? What's the difference between a saved person and a non-saved person? These type of questions. They, 
and attempts to answer these things. And so you have, you have popular ideas in Christianity, certain forms of Christianity, um, the, in, in you know, that Bible-based, evangelical, uh, American-style Christianity. You know, you have concepts like once saved, always saved. Basically, it means if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your ticket is punched for eternity. You know, you are saved. You are saved forever. But there are problems with that. There are big problems with that. There, there, there are spiritual problems for the individual. There's problems for the church. There's problems theologically. There's there are biblical problems with justifying that. You know, one of the issues with that is um, lawlessness. Lawlessness, which is the idea of I don't, I don't have. There's no law over me. There's nothing that binds me. Um, I should obey God. I should obey the Bible, but that has nothing to do with my salvation. So you, you have some Christians who say that it has absolutely nothing to do with your salvation. You believe in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what you do or what you don't do. You are saved and you are saved forever. Is this is this according to a specific school of thought or is this just like um, cultural Christianity? No, that, that, these are schools of thought. OK, you OK. Like it seems like the. Seems like this is quite a popular view, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, yeah. it is a very popular view. Um, it's this is part of the appeal of Christianity, actually. Uh, and this and this played a role. This played a role in in in, in your issue. And, and yeah, because I, you know, as I began to really learn and read mm. books and read systematic theologies about these things and listen listen to different theologians. And like I said, I'm a seeker. I like to. Right. I, I don't. I want to. I don't want to hear just one opinion. I want to hear the right. opinions of the other schools of thought also. Right. Right. And after hearing those other opinions, oh, you know that kind of makes sense. Right. You know, why would you have a Bible full of commandments? Not just the old, old, the old Testament. Even the New Testament is full of imperatives and commands. But you're saying you're not duty bound or obligated to follow these commands. You have salvation no matter what you do. Once saved, always saved. Um, and then the issue of, you know, saved by faith alone, saved by faith alone. Actions have nothing to do with it. Obedience has nothing to do with it. Your lifestyle has nothing to do with it. How much you conform to the will of God has nothing to do with it. It's just faith alone. Even something so fundamental to Christianity as Jesus death on the cross. Why did Jesus have to die on the cross? What does that okay? Jesus dies on the cross. What does that what does that have to do with me? What does that mean for me? Mm. Early Christians said he died on the cross to defeat Satan. Some others okay. said he died on the cross as a ransom to Satan. A thousand years in the in, um, I believe the, the man was named Eslam, he came with the the uh, the idea of substitutionary atonement that he that Jesus was a substitute for the sinner. So the sinner deserves to be punished on the cross, but Jesus is a substitute. And that's one okay. of the prevailing ideas in mainstream biblical Christianity. But that idea right. didn't come into existence until a thousand years after Christ. But yeah. that's what's been- I've, that's been I've, only known, I've only known of that last theory that you've mentioned. I've never even heard of the other stuff, the, the yeah. first couple of and there, there are others besides those three. Mm, right, right, right. I've al I've always assumed it was. I always assumed that last theory of uh, being a substitute for the sinners and whatnot. I always assumed that was in the Bible. I think. But yeah, it was, it was Paula. But they is uh, those who hold that position do have verses that they point. To. Okay, so so but everyone's in trouble. Like, but people who have other positions have the have passages in the Bible that they point to. Right, 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 right. The problem is these these fundamental doctrines of Christianity are not explicitly dealt with in detail in the Bible. Understood. Everything is being extracted implicitly. Understood. You know, cobble together different verses and you come up with a particular theory. There's nothing okay. it, it, it explicitly that says Jesus is God or that he's that he his being is the same being as the Father. And none of, none of these things. Yeah, I understand. SubhanAllah. Um, so, so what happened? Um, okay, so, so 
you were were you overwhelmed by these differences of opinions and these new things that you were learning or um what happened I you want to say overwhelmed yeah i wouldn't say overwhelmed it just sparked my curiosity even more okay it made me want to study more and really get get you know i i, I finally came to the to a decision and i said to myself okay unless i'm absolutely absolutely convinced by the bible i am not affirming any doctrine right i'm not going to affirm, affirm any doctrine i remember there was a, a friend of mine who's a pastor who went to a seminary with me and we had a conversation about do you need to believe in the trinity in order to be to be saved and he conceded to my point that there's nothing in the bible that says a person has to believe in the trinity and he, and he i remember he said to me you you know you're right. There's nothing in the Bible that says a person has to believe in the Trinity to be saved, even though I believe that. I know it's true, but I can't find the proof in the Bible. And I, over and over again, I, this became a pattern where you had these doctrines that had been crafted and designed by the church fathers and had been made canon by some particular uh, church conference or whatever uh, in the first four or five hundred years of uh, Christianity. And declared uh, absolute truth within the church, and when you challenged and pushed back on it, you people had to concede that there's nothing you can't really prove it in the Bible, but you have to believe in it. You just have to right. believe, it or you don't have right. salvation. Right. All right. So at that, when I finally got, when I started knocking down pillars of Christianity through study. I said to myself, well, I don't know if I can I can be this this whole this evangelical Calvinist Christian thing. I can't do this anymore. Um, so at this point, returning to Islam was not in my head at, the, at this moment. That was not. This option. was this was in which year? This was maybe uh, we're talking four years ago. Okay, four years ago. Yeah. So that wasn't an option yet. So. I, you know, I explored different uh, Christian uh, denominations, seeing maybe I'll go to a different church or be a part of a different organization or denomination. Um, I even explored, because I had a, a friend of mine who was in seminary who was a Messianic Jew, which is basically blending Judaism and Christianity together, you know, where you, you practice the, uh, the, uh, the holidays of the Jews and you do different, the different rituals, but you believe Jesus is the Messiah. I, I, I contemplated doing that, um, seriously. And then the last doctrine that failed was the Trinity. That was hard to get. Oh, they, they believe in that too. Yes. So the, the, the main line may say the Jews believe in the Trinity, even though there's, there's an aspect of them that have rejected right. the Trinity. They kind of believe in, um, what's called, called adoptionism. Jesus was a prophet and the spirit of God came upon him and then he became the son of God, which was mm -hmm. one of the original doctrines of the church. Before, before the Trinity was set in stone, the, there's a comment by one of the church fathers saying that the majority of the Christians were adoptionists. That Jesus was a human being who the spirit, the spirit came upon him. And when the spirit came upon him, he, 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 he had the title of the son of God. So after I started questioning the, uh, the Trinity, I even thought about, like I said, I, I, I contemplated everything. Everything. Yeah. I, I, I looked at every option. I even thought about converting to Judaism, you know, and I, I explored that. And I sat and watched a, a, a video of a rabbi, and the rabbi was talking about the Noahic laws, which they believe that if a person, whether they're even not a Jew, if the person believes in one God and they have some system of uh, religious law, then they have a place in the life to come. They have salvation without being a Jew. So he said that when people, when non-Jews come to him saying, I want to be a Jew, he tells them, don't bother. Just follow the no, Noahic laws. Don't eat pork. Don't consume blood. Believe in one God. And have a system of righteousness wow. to follow. So 
from that standpoint, from the from an Orthodox Jewish standpoint, Muslims have salvation. But guess who doesn't have salvation? Christians. Christians do not have salvation. And I've told this to Christians, and I had Christians look at look me dead in the eye and say, You're lying. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not lying. No. Uh, so, so who, who, an Orthodox Jew cannot even go inside of a church. Right. They can't because it's a place of idolatry. Jesus is a pagan idol in Judaism. And you have all these e evangelical Christians in, uh, in the West who are pro-Israel. And that's your prerogative if that's what you want to be. But, you know, it's almost become a pillar of their religion to be, to be so Zionistic and, and for Judaism. Right. And most of them do not know this, that the average Jew, a Jew can't even enter their church and they believe that Jesus is an idol and they believe that they're going to hell and they believe the Muslim is going to heaven. So once I understood that, I was like, okay, well, <laughs> from, okay, that was the, like the last option. Though. Okay, if it's not going to be convert to Judaism and according to the Jewish rabbi, you don't have to convert to, uh, to uh, Judaism to have salvation. You could even be a Muslim and have salvation. Then uh, maybe, maybe I should think about Islam again. And wallahi, wallahi, I tell you this. It, the beginning of Ramadan in 2008 came. And I got a text message from a, a friend of mine. Brother Abu Zakaria, I'm giving him credit. Abu Zakaria, he sent me a text message, and the text message is, is this: is this Abu Zakaria from Ayara, or is no, this a different? No. Abu this is a different. Uh, this is a different brother. Okay. He sent me a text message, and he said, "Assalamu alaikum. Are you ready to come back home?" I hadn't heard from this brother in years. I hadn't heard from this. I haven't spoken to him. hadn't received a text message. We hadn't had any communication in years. At that point in my life, which coincided with the beginning of Ramadan, he sends me a text message to ask me, are you ready to come back home? And you know, I, you know, I was being a smart, smart butt, and I sent back, are you ready to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? <laughs> 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 and so uh, we started talking, you know, and we started talking, and I just found it weird those things coincided with each other at the same exact time. And I really started thinking, well, if you're open-minded enough to explore everything, you say that you want to see the proof for everything. You want to see the evidence for everything. Will you uh, take a look and to see whether or not it was a mistake to leave Islam? Are you willing to go that far? And I really thought about that. There was part of a part of me that resisted that, and it got to the point where, well, I I would wake up in the morning and I would go into the bathroom and I would look in the mirror, and I couldn't look at my own reflection in the mirror. I couldn't look into my own eyes. I knew something. Okay. Okay, I'll look into it. How about that? I'll look into it. I'll, I'll, I'll at least explore the idea. So I started going, I went to a masjid and I would just, first day I, I just wanted to sit and observe. And I watched the brothers make salah. And then after doing that a few times, they, I started, I got into a conversation with the Imam. Well, I another brother that I knew back in the days he just happens to be at the masjid you know and we started talking so i'm now i'm talking to the brother on via text that i hadn't spoken to in years I'm talking to this other brother that i hadn't seen in years and speaking to the, the local imam at the masjid and i'm going to the masjid and this is all during ramadan and it was like my it was on there was if he, if he had a heart covered in steel and some and you poured acid and it melted the steel down so you got to the fleshy part of the heart. That's what it was like. The hardness against the hardness that was inside me 
towards the idea of Islam and returning, even returning to Islam, it began to just slowly melt away day by day. Each day of Ramadan, it just melted away. Seeing the brothers make salah, it's like, wow, I remember that salah. I remember, I remember what that was like. And I was still going to church, mind you. So I, would, I remember going to church and the style of worship was, you know, you had what's called a praise band. It was basically like a, a like a, you know, uh, kind of like a pop rock band playing Christian contemporary music. And uh, they were, you know, doing the music and everybody's waving their hands and shouting hallelujah. And I really couldn't get into it. I, I just, I was like, man, this, is this worship? This is worship? Watching a concert. This is worship. Because this, Jesus didn't worship like this. Peace be upon him. Moses didn't worship like this. Peace be upon him. Uh, Abraham didn't worship like this. Peace be upon him. David, John the Baptist, Solomon, none of them worshiped like this. Even the disciples, the earliest Christians, in everyone you saw in the book of Acts inside the New Testament, they didn't worship like this. So even, the, even Paul warns about worshiping upon your own will and desires and not upon the commands of God. So if leading into the last 10 days of Ramadan, I looked at, I, you know, I spoke to myself. I said, at the beginning of, the, of this month, you had no intentions of becoming Muslim, but events have taken place. And I, I know within myself, these are supernatural events. I didn't organ, orchestrate these things. The people involved didn't get together and orchestrate these things. This is orchestrated by God. So what do you do with that now? Do you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inviting you back to Islam. Even after everything you did, even after leaving, even if you being on ABN, you being involved with David and Sam Shimon and CP and all these people, the stuff that came out of your mouth, blasphemous things, yet he's still so merciful, he's going to invite you back to Islam. What do you say? What are you going to do? So I took my shahana and I returned back to Islam. Abu it's it's it's. Uh, I'm not used to uh, doing interviews like this. Yeah, you've you've uh, caught me off guard, and um, I don't really know how to react. I'm really happy. Well, I'm really happy for, especially you know what you're saying at the end. Um, you know the, the the doors of Allah's mercy are are always open, and and even though you were in those situations, you were in the ABN and all that. That that like um, that hit me hard, Dahi. That hit me hard. I like Barakfik. All praises due to God. This is what this is all about. Hey, Allah. It's not about debating who is the smart guy versus the dumb guy. It's not about who has the best arguments. It's not about um, what's superior, Western culture or Eastern culture. There's some people who want to who want who want people to think on this base level. See, I can if I keep you on a base unconscious level, I can manipulate you how I want to. But we have to be conscious. What is this? It's about glorifying the creator of the heavens and the earth. You shall have no other gods besides me. That's what he said, according to the book. The heavens and the earth cannot contain me. That's what he says, according to the book. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. Echad. That's what it says, according to the book. All these years, all these decades, I've been seeking the truth, trying to find the truth. And really, in reality, the truth was sitting in front of me the whole, inside, the whole entire time. But as human beings, our vision is imperfect and our minds are imperfect. Our means of understanding and interpreting things are imperfect. Sometimes Allah has to allow you to go through things and experience things in order to get you to see what's in front of your face the whole entire time. Uh, Abu Yazid, a very important question. Uh, 
How many shows did you have on ABM? How many, how many episodes were you on there? Uh, it's, it's hard for me to say because I was active on ABN starting from 2011 to probably, I think like 2018. So I was active all those years. Oh, wow. I, I did some number of shows every single year during that time. Okay. So tens of shows? Yeah. Okay. Would it, would it get to, would it get to a hundred or is a hundred too much? I think a hundred will probably be too much. Okay. Yeah. Closer to 50, maybe 50. And that sounds about right. Maybe okay. Around. Give so a, you've give had, a take, give or take a few. Okay. So, so if you had 50 shows calling people away from Islam in, in those shows, you've brought arguments against Islam reasons for people to not join or not become Muslims reasons for Muslims to leave Islam. Are you today, um, someone who disbelieves in, in the material that you brought forward and that you, and, and do you feel that the questions that you put forth towards Muslims, do you feel that you've answered those questions yourself and, and you're completely um, satisfied with, you know, the, the solutions that you, you've uh, come across? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the argumentation is, is, is horrible. Even from an okay. uh, uh, as, aspect of logic, it's full of okay. logical fallacies, first and foremost. So did, many did logical fallacies. Do you things. feel the information is the inf a lot of times the information is absolutely wrong, incorrect. The interpretation is interpretation that no Muslim scholar would ever imagine or come up with and hasn't come up with in you know 1500, 1500 years of Islamic history. Nobody ever right. thought of interpreting a passage in that form. Even if you simply did something as read things in their context. The, the accusations completely just fall apart. It doesn't make, even make sense. Did, did you come to these realizations after you accepted Islam or during that process of, of studying Christianity? During Start the process of studying Christianity. Because okay. another thing I've said, there's nothing, whatever criticism you have about the Quran and the Sunnah, it exists in the Bible. And sometimes, <laughs> You, you, if you want to talk about the verse of the sword, then talk about the commandment in the Old Testament where Israel was told to absolutely destroy Canaan, the people of Canaan, down to the children and the animals. Now, of course, the people will say, well, that was the Old Testament. But it was God, right? You say Jesus is God, right? Well, Jesus commanded the Israelites to kill the bash children's head against the rocks. That's, that doesn't sound sweet, you know, Sweet lily, lily of the valley to me. That sounds like a man of war. The Bible says the Lord is a man of war. So there's, yeah, warfare is sanctioned in Abrahamic religions. Right. It is. You can't criticize Islam and then give a pass to Christianity and Judaism. You, okay. This is what I talk about being consistent. Right, right, right. If you were to be consistent, you couldn't make these arguments. Right. Uh, inshallah, this was a lesson to everyone, to me as well. Yani. I, I, uh, this was spiritually uplifting for me. I, I really appreciate you sharing your story, sharing your journey. And um, I'd love to have you on again yani, in the future, if possible. Well, inshallah, you. I'm very much open to that. Habibi, Habibi Abu Yazid. Inshallah, I'll be there. Any, any last words to the viewers? Yeah, I would just like people to know that um, if you saw me previously, you saw me on ABN or some other outlet, or you saw me debating, um, know that a person can be sincere, but they can be sincerely wrong. And it takes more of a man or a woman to correct their mistakes than for a person to continue in error with it not wanting to admit they made a mistake because they don't want to be embarrassed they don't want to say i was wrong it, it it takes more character to say i was wrong 
than to cover up your mistake. Like the word kafir is one who covers, like a farmer covers up a seed. God is more important than your system. If any system of belief, any affiliation to any group, right? God is the most important thing. It's all about worshiping God. It's all about your devotion to God. If being Muslim means you're more devoted to God, you love God more, then you should be Muslim. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. It doesn't matter what names they're going to call you. It doesn't matter um, if they make fun of you. It doesn't matter if you have to admit you were wrong. You will be right in the long run. I would rather be right in the long run than to cover the truth up to be right for a moment. Allah barak fika wa yazid barak Allah fikum. Wa yaku. Rest of you guys. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.